Well, I think the single most important thing, you know, I'm a little biased because I live in the United States. I'm based in Colorado. And uh, so obviously I think a lot about U.S. policy and where the United States is going. But I think the single biggest development for our industry uh, is going to be what Janet Yellen does. And so now that the Democrats have taken the Senate, uh, she will be the next Treasury Secretary. And basically she's going to have to make the decisions of what is FinCEN going to do? What is the SEC going to do? What is the CFTC going to do? And we've kind of gotten to the put up or shut up phase of cryptocurrency. So for a long time, it was, well, we'll let it mature and evolve and we'll give them a jubilee and a grace period. And we'll go after like people who kind of rock the boat too much or uh, obvious fraud, but we're not going to get too hands on. And recently, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, he, he kind of dropped a whole bunch of regulations on the way out. Uh, for example, uh, the Treasury Department's interpretation of the, the FATF regulations, uh, the travel rule compliance. So now we don't have this idea of anonymous wallets anymore. Uh, so these kinds of things are coming. And Yellen is going to be the secretary that during her tenure is going to make those decisions either directly or indirectly. Much of that policy may be set in 2021 or 2022. And this can be everything from stable coin regulation to custodial standards to how they're going to regulate DeFi or not regulate DeFi what level of KYC is required for everything, what level of privacy you have to have, what level of transparency you have to have, what consumer protections are going to be applied, when and how the SEC is allowed to get involved. The Ripple test is likely going to come out because of this litigation with Ripple. It's either going to expand Howie or contract Howie based upon how that litigation goes. Uh, and so that is probably going to be a big deal because whatever that gets set, it, the European Union will likely follow somewhat similar regulations. Mm -hmm. And then the whole world will either be uh, equivalent or contrasting, but it's going to set the global regulatory standard. And uh, then China is obviously setting their own standards. So there'll be this US standard, these Chinese standards, and you know, there's, they're going to try to sort all that out. So no matter what I do, I, I think Yellen is probably going to have far more impact than Vitalik or myself or any other people in the industry. If it's done in the right way, I think she's the person who decides whether we have $100,000 Bitcoin or $1,000 Bitcoin. Because if she, for example, says, yeah, institutional investors, everything's fine. And here's an obvious path to diversify assets. The money managers simply have too much money. If you're the sovereign wealth fund of Norway, you have a trillion and a half dollars. If you're BlackRock, you have more. How the hell do you get 6% returns, 9% returns when they tell you you can no longer invest in petrochemicals or in this and that? And, SB sustainable. You got to do it somewhere. So there are a lot of them are saying, well, yeah, we'll throw a percentage point into crypto. What's 1% of a trillion and a half dollars? That's not a that's lot. Not peanuts. That's a big deal. Uh, that's so a big deal. You know, collectively, that could mean hundreds of billions of dollars of value mm -hmm. flowing into our industry. The other thing is there's demographic changes that are creating floodgates for our industry as well. They're lowering floodgates. In particular, if you poll anyone under the age of 30 in the United States, they're statistically more likely to hold a cryptocurrency than a stock or bond or gold. So the young are buying our stuff in our industry and they're not buying the old stuff. So there's a movement of wealth there. So the US government's gonna have to make some decisions of whether to speed that up, slow that down, keep it at the same pace. So that's the first major thing I think is gonna occur in our industry. Second, I, uh, there's a lot of technology that's forcing a, a conversation and the great movement of value from proof of work to proof of stake is occurring. Currently, the leader there is Ethereum, is Ethereum too. And obviously, we're Hellions on their, on their heels, nipping at them. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be the, the Facebook to their MySpace, and uh, we'll see what happens there. But you know, uh, all of us collectively, whether you're Polkadot or EOS or Tezos or Cardano, uh, we're trying to say that proof of stake is much better than proof of work, at least the Bitcoin flavor of proof of work. And F2 is the 800 pound gorilla that's really pushing that. So what's happening is a lot of funds are saying, hey, there's going to be a reallocation of the distribution of wealth, we call it Bitcoin dominance, from proof of work to something else. And they're starting to bet on portfolio. So that trend is going to get really interesting. Hmm. And it's going to open up a lot of regulatory questions and tax questions about the operation of proof of stake that are distinctly different from proof of work. And this is definitely the year where we're going to see that occur in mass. And this is the year that we're going to see that heating up quite a bit. And then finally, this is the year where people are going to, in my view, start really talking about some of the uncomfortable truths of blockchain systems. The cult of Satoshi, you know, I, I started with Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin. I think it's an amazing thing. 
but it's a replicated system. And what that effectively means is for it to work, everybody has to know each other's stuff. Everybody, when you're running a full node, has the same data. That works when you have a gigabyte blockchain. That doesn't work when you have a petabyte blockchain, an exabyte blockchain. So if mm -hmm. we're really talking about use and adoption, you can't have a system where everybody's equal and everybody stores the same data and uh, everybody has access to a supercomputer. It's yeah. physically impossible. So you'll have to go from a homogeneous system where everybody's the same to a heterogeneous system. And you also have to mm -hmm. start discussing some uncomfortable truths, like maybe we don't store everything forever, especially with smart contracts. Let, let's say you're doing a gambling smart contract. It's the fact that I got two pair on the third hand of poker and a game I played seven years ago, something that we should preserve for the rest of time? Probably not. But then you're violating Satoshi's principles. You're now saying we go from immutable and everything's preserved forever to we're going to prune things and throw things away. So data is going to become an economic agent at some point, and you're going to have to pay rent for it. And if you don't, at some point, it's going to have to go away. But how to organize that and how to sort that out is, is going to be quite difficult. So the movement from replicated to distributed where we all have different views of the system and we don't all store the same things and consume the same resources, whether it be computation or data or network resources. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion for a long time with things like IPFS and these things about how to do that, uh, but we haven't quite gotten there and we're getting to a point where adoption is now forcing that conversation. Ethereum alone is in the many terabytes. It's getting just too expensive to do things. And they're already sharding. And when you start sharding, you now have availability problems because not everybody has the same view. Okay, so that conversation is really starting to, to get active. And you know, we're certainly a participant in it. There are certain things you can do to kind of offset it. For example, proof of stake usually increases hierarchy by having stake pools and these other things. So you have these supercomputers that are always on and they can form the backbone of your system. And then everybody else may be a light client but these architectures are being rapidly explored. And uh, this is the year where I think those inconvenient truths are gonna translate into progress and then eventually uh, adoption. And once that gets settled, these systems are going to be uh, significantly more competitive than Bitcoin or other systems. And finally, there has to be some sorting and blending of identity with all of this. So for a long time, we always acknowledged, yeah, we need identity. And we even created standards in our industry. Like through the W3C, we created the DIT standard, the Decentralized Identifier. It was great work from Chris Allen and all these other guys. And Microsoft uses it. We're a member of the DIF, the Digital Identity Foundation with Microsoft and all these other companies. I think there's 35 of them now. We have an identity product called Prism. Uh, that, that product is being used in production in the country of Georgia for academic credentials. And you know we're negotiating multi-million user deals with it throughout Africa. So that's an identity unit and it's blockchain agnostic. So we talk about interoperability, but when you talk about movement of users, you're actually talking about the movement of identity between these types of systems. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you sort that out? How do these things get uh, you know, not only created, but authenticated? And then also how do you revoke and transfer them? And how do you extend them and so forth? Super difficult question. And then what happens when you start talking about non-human identity? Uh, intelligent agents like dApps and DAOs and these things, smart contracts that live on the chain. You want to identify an escrow contract. You want to identify a DAO. You want to identify an application like a DEX, for example. It needs a unique identifier because that thing is going to start talking to other machines on the chain. So for a long time, we've been conceptualizing it. Mike Kern was talking about it, Turing Festival, I think, in 2012. So it's been a long time coming, but this is the year where it's getting big because the regulators are starting to demand it. They're starting yeah. to say, hey, you can no longer withdraw your Binance account to just any old wallet, be KYC wallet. Okay, well, what does that actually mean under the hood? How do we actually KYC that? How do you actually know I own it? How do I prove I have custody of it and so forth? So that's the, the other corollary is the breaking of Satoshi principle that this concept of fungibility we're going from fungible things to non-fungible things in that not all tokens are created equally. In fact, we're even seeing that in Bitcoin with um, newly mined coins versus older coins. There's actually mm -hmm. a premium on newly mined coins because they have no transaction history behind them. So they've never touched Iran. They've never touched North Korea. They've never touched sanctioned countries and so forth. So certain firms are willing to pay a little bit more money for newly mined Right, that's Bitcoin a great point. Clients, because there's no de minimis clause in money laundering or terrorist financing. 
right? So they're the same asset, but the history is relevant to so actually breach fungibility. And so more yeah. of that is going to come in much more pervasive ways. If you like that, come back for more. All you have to do is click like, always comment, we love that, and subscribe. And don't forget to watch the next one.